a recording with Reverend Timothy to Ascension number 0020070 real 5. How would you describe your relationships with Reverend Kwek Kyok Chan and Deacon Sui Chiang Tai? We are very close, working three people as one, so we are known as the three musketeers. We interacted with each other in a most wonderful way. And uh, that's how unity is strength. In no time, by 1956, we were able to host the Far Eastern Council of Christian Churches, the chapter in the Far East of the ICC, which is the international. And in 1956, we hosted the third Assembly of the Far East Council of Christian Churches, at which Reverend Kuek and Reverend Su Chiang Tai were ordained through the, our council. Also, we had uh, Bishop Thompson of the Reformed Evangel Episcopal Church break away from the Anglican who came. And so he ordained Reverend Pua Hock Singh of Pasipanyang Church. Pua Hock Singh was a great follower of John Sung. Immediately after the revival, he turned his house into a church and he would preach in his house. That was in 1935. But by 1956, that's after the war, quite many years, he was still serving the Lord very fervently. So we took the opportunity to ordain Paul Hoxing because he's an Anglican. So we had Bishop Thompson, one person, to ordain him. So through these uh, events, the church moved very fast with our church having two more ordained ministers. Talking about church growth, um, in the first seven years after Life BP became the came into being, which is 1955. How were the other BP churches in Singapore established? It was mostly through me because I was the only ordained. So, Life Church started a Sunday school in the Sambawang Estate in 1957, January the 20th. So, out of the Sunday school, has come out today the Sambawang BP Church that is now building a new church at Sime and they got their land at $6 million. Just to show how from that early beginning we started the Sunday School 1957 at the Sambawang Estate. Today they have grown so big that they have got several missions and they are building a new church. And then we took over Zion Kindergarten at Serangoon Gardens from my good friend Reverend Jason Lin of the pioneering in Dark Borneo fame. He started this kindergarten with funds from Indonesia. He was a foreigner. But then it fell through. They built a kindergarten and they were not able to pay they paid only partly. So finally they gave it over to Life Church. And I translated his book. We became good friends. But only we had to pay the debt they were they were doing they were owing. So we received this, so we started Zion BP Church. And out of Zion BP Church in one year we have Faith BP Church, which is the Chinese congregation. That was in nineteen fifty seven. And I had to be honorary kindergarten principal to, to promote the work. That's how we struggle along. And subsequently, what about the other churches that sprang up from the... So the, most of the other churches sprang up from Life Church because I was very restless. And when we have a door open, I go in and help them to start the Sunday school. And on Sunday, I preach to them while I preach in my main church life. 
Then we go there at the free hours, whether it be morning or afternoon. So what were the other churches that were... So very quickly from Zion and Faith in Saragun Garden and uh, Sambawang in Sambang Estate, we went over to Red Hill and developed uh, Mount Carmel. From there, we went over to uh, Paspanjang and developed Galilee. And from there, we went over to Jurong and we developed Jurong. And from there, we went over to Tekong, Pulu Tekong, and we developed Tekong. That year, we developed four churches in a matter of a few months. Which year was that? 1960. Yeah, there being no other ordained minister except me and Quack. But Sue was not in the pastoral ministry because uh, he was uh, a sort of an honorary pastor. He was still running his business. But by 1960, he migrated to New York. And he has been there ever since. Now he's dead already. So how would you describe the church growth in uh, within the BP context? Well, it was quite uh, astounding to the people outside because in one year we developed four churches. Of course, they are very young. And then from there, we kept, kept on developing. Um, it is truly a work of the Lord. It was through what we call a Sunday school movement. We got our lay people there to start the Sunday school. Then, with the Sunday school, after one or two years, we start the church, you see. And that's how we grew. Right. Subsequently, we understand that there were some conflicts or disagreement among the BB churches in Singapore. Can you elaborate on that? The... First, uh, unhappiness was in 1968 when the Billy Graham movement held uh, Asia South Pacific Congress. And I was appointed correspondent by the by the Australian paper, I think it's New Life, to report on Billy Graham. I was a correspondent official appointed from Melbourne. And I re reported on Billy Graham and of course I said things that were not to their liking. As a result of it, some members of a church deacons or one or two deacons were unhappy. Even my brother was not very happy. So that was our first rumbling. But um, the real split came in 1987-88. But in, as early as 1968, there was some unhappiness. What was the cause of the unhappiness? Because they said that why you are so negative, you always say bad things about Billy Graham. Mm -hmm. And what was your own personal conviction? My uh, own personal conviction was that Billy Graham was veering from his original stand because when he was becoming, a, when he became a great evangelist, as early as 1949, in Los Angeles, he was a fund fundamentalist preacher and he announced that he would have nothing to do with modernism, liberalism, communism, right down the line. But by 1957, he changed tune. So by 1968, he was more and more leaning on the other side and commending the Pope and so forth. So I was warning them, I said, you see, this is how he different, differentiates from his uh, previous stand that he announced. 
And my brother was against me, but in 1978, when yeah, yeah, my younger brother was against me too. But in 1978, when Billy Graham came to Singapore and held a citywide campaign, you can look back all these uh, historic facts under Bob, Bobby Sung's uh, In His Good Time. It's all there. And if you read that book, you read about me also. One of the bad boys. <laughs> But anyway, by 1978, my brother saw very clearly that Billy Graham was veering farther and farther away from his original. So he took a stand in 1978, very strong. And then he took over the leadership. He became stronger than I. So now he is uh, the front runner. I'm playing second singles. So you mentioned about um, this agreement taking place in 1968, but the actual um, split came in... Uh, in 1988. Yes. 87 versus 88, yes. that came, came to a break. Can you please elaborate on this? Well, in the meantime, we observed that there were the younger churches that were not very happy with the mother church. And one, in Life BP Church. Against Life BP, that is a mother church, that is a, a founding church. Mm -hmm. And one of them was Mount Carmel. And the younger leadership, although they come to our 25th anniversary Silver Jubilee celebration of the BP Church, that was in 1975. At that time, I could observe that there was some, some unhappiness. And in my speech, I said, if you're not careful, this movement that is to stand, the ecumenical movement, in the next 25 years, we will be swept away. But the prediction came too early. 1975, 1988, another 13 years, we, we broke up. As early as 1975, 68, 75, there was felt, you know, an underground current of resistance. And, yes? To, to the... To life church's strong stand. Against the ecumenical movement? They are more sympathetic now to the ecumenical movement against the mother church, the reformists, and life church is number one in the lead, they say. How, did you, how do you feel about this whole thing, having... Um, started and established the life churches in Singapore to have a little... Well, uh, to be more philosophical, to, I had to say, well, you just have to accept the way of all flesh. The founders have struck out and the younger ones begin to veer and then they say that we are extremists and they are the, the good ones. It is, but we have uh, stood strong from beginning to now. What about the mother's church stand towards um, the charismatic movement in the sense? So in 19... Uh, we were not very articulate, not very, very clear without coming to a showdown. So we do not know exactly how each pastor felt. But then when we came to a head in 19... 88, then the young Quick Quick Sui Hua stood up to stand for charismatism. And he says that uh, these are meaningful, ecstatic utterances. But we say that this is jabbering and it is not the work of the Holy Spirit. So the younger leadership already is taking a stand against the original stand of the Mother Church. And also in the matter of working together with ecumenical people and so forth, the younger set, led by Kwek Siwa and David Wong of Mount Carmel, these are the two leaders. They also take a different stand. So that's how the split came. 1987 to 88, there were many meetings to try to reconcile each other, but it just could not be reconciled. And in fact, I predicted to Reverend Quick, I said, the Senate will be split 
as you'll see. And by 1988, October 30, we split. Do you see any positive outcome of the split? Would you liken it to a split between Paul and Barnabas? No, it is not that sort of a split. In their case, it was a matter of uh, working out the missionary method. But this is a case of a different uh, doctrinal stand. It's a different thing between that, between Barnabas and Paul. Um, we just uh, have the split, and the split has uh, given rise to good results, also as well as uh, bad results. In every situation, you know, good and bad. Let's talk about the good results. The good result is that we are no more running a three-legged race. You know, running a three-legged race and instead of four legs and uh, two legs each freely, you now got, uh, you've got to work together in an un unequal yoke. So when we got split, we have the freedom, each one, to develop our own. So, in so far as Life Church, we and Calvary Church, we could strike out. I mean, without being hampered, and in in their case, they also strike out without being hampered. Each one not going on its own way, but especially in the use of the Bible, we stick to the Old King James as the authorized version, the good version, but then they changed all to NIV, which is a corrupt version. The new translation is very popular, and it has already supplanted the King, King James. So they are on the popular side now. They use NIV. We cannot stop them. I want to put this on historical record for future reference by uh, Bible scholars or researchers. What is your stand towards the NIV version? I have written with Dr. Jeffrey Koo a first book of theology. It is going to be out in a matter of three weeks, now in a press. And I call it a theology for every Christian. And book one is Knowing God and His Word. And in this uh, first book of theology, we have a very good treatment between the NIV and the KJV. And here we show how the NIV is a very much corrupted text by Westcott and Hort. These were two scholars who determined this, but now it has been discovered that they have done a very, very evil thing. So we are crusading against the NIV so that when we take over the book room here, we now have only KJV selling, no more NIV, no RSV, no all the other versions which are corrupt. Mm -hmm. On what basis would you say that the NIV is corrupt? On the basis, on the basis that they follow the line of Westcott and Hort. Westcott and Hort were two Cambridge Greek scholars, and they took over. The KJV has been translated on the basis of the received text, textus receptus, the traditional text. But when Westcott and Hort came into the picture, they, in 1881, had overturned the KJV by putting out a new English version called the Revised Version, RV. And all those things that exalt Jesus Christ, His virgin birth, His deity, the infallibility of the Scriptures, have been, as far as possible, diluted by a new text to say, oh, we got now two old, oldest texts called the Synodicus and the Vaticanus. These are better because they are very old. 
They come from the fourth century. So whatever they say in the traditional text, they change. But when they change, they dilute the word of God. And uh, where well, it's a long story, they also have a new way of translating the Bible called di dynamic equivalence. When they have the liberty of throwing out words to say we translate the idea as a whole, but the exact words are taken out, but King James translates word for word. So for this reason, it has been discovered more and more by um, a new movement to go back to the KJV, and we are part of it. So my book of theology will explain very clearly 176 pages. When it comes out, you'll get a copy. So coming back to this issue about, we talk about the positive results of the split between, uh, among some of the churches, uh, the BP churches in Singapore. What would be the negative results of the split? The negative is that the younger churches now have no uh, leadership, have no one to look to. So each one will go on its own, you see. So they have uh, this idea, that idea, they run on their own and some of them succumb to the new version. So they accept the new version without the synod overs oversight. And uh, like um, things we can do better as a united body, now we cannot because we are split into four or five groups. So each group is on its own. Let's move on, Reverend. Let's talk about the Far Eastern Bible College. Tell us a little bit about its inception. As early as 1954, I met Dr. Paulson of the Singapore Bible College. He was a, an American missionary to Indonesia, but he got stuck in Singapore. That was 1954, and I met him. And we invited him to speak at our Bible camp. At one of the Bible camps, I told him, I feel the need of starting a Bible college, year 54. I was only back four years. The burden was getting heavier and heavier on me because I rejoiced so much the truth I got. And we've got young men now coming up to serve the Lord. Then you've got to send everyone to America. We cannot afford it. So I thought, we should start a Bible college. But Paulson, hearing this, he caught on. So he started the Singapore Bible College before I could do anything. So Rem Quick was very close to me at that time. He said, you must go back and get your master's degree before you come, before you start the college. And yet I was, I was afraid to head the college because it's no joke to start the college and you are the president. Anyway, I went to study and I got my Master of Secret Theology. 1958, I studied until 1959. I got it in one year. So we came back and I kept on driving for it. So at that time, we developed into a presbytery. By 1960, we were a presbytery. That means to say group of churches already. And the Presbytery supported the idea and gave the green light that we'll start the Bible College and we'll cooperate with the Independent Board for Presbyterian Foreign Missions, our American Mission Board. And uh, they will send someone to be principal. And we had uh, a missionary to China in mind, Dr. John, um, Dr. John I forgot his name surname anyway he was to come to head the college but when the time came no nobody came and so I had to head the college anyway so the college was founded in 1962, 17th of September, when our life church by that time was almost built. 
not this part, but the back part, the air and the church. But one year before that, 1961, I started the evening theological class for one year in Princep Street Church, and I had 15 students. But by 1962, 17th of September, when they opened here, for full-time students, we had three. Two from Batu Pahat and one from Singapore. From Batu Pahat is Ng Seng Chiu and Eddie Chan. Both of them were teachers. They gave up their teaching job. And Ivy was also a teacher, my wife. She was one of our two first girl students. And we started by announcing a four-year program granting a BTH to the chagrin and anger of all Singapore church leaders said this young upstart he wants to grant a degree when Singapore Bible College did not grant a degree yet they were only on the diploma and I was announcing a degree program so we had brickbats thrown at us from all quarters so that by the end of the year two left so I had only one student Ng Seng Chiu went to study in Hong Kong Alliance Seminary. Eddie Chan went to join Bible, Singapore Bible College. And Ivy Tan was going to leave also. But the Lord did not give her the liberty, so she felt restrained, so she stayed on. So by the end of the year, we have one student left. As I was going up my parsonage, by that time I was studying in the, in the church Already yeah, yeah, with my first wife. I wept. I said, Lord, I know, I didn't know it's so hard. Three students become one. If I knew this, I would not have started the college. The Lord comforted me. No, it's all right. You just stay put. So by the second year, we have four students. You got three more students come in. With I will became four. So that's not so bad. And from there, we struggle for one decade by the end of one decade, maybe at about 12 or 15 students. The first decade was very, very hard life. And now? Now it's very pleasant. Now, now I am just coasting along with happiness. Mm -hmm. Because uh, at the foremost, um, this um, teacher here in my son-in-law, how the Lord blessed me with that, this Dr. Jeffrey Koo. And he's also librarian and also acting uh, registrar. And I have the, all the others who come in, Kwek Swan Yu, he's taking his doctorate too. Go Seng Fong, he's got his doctorate. Bobby Fee, he's got his doctorate. And uh, Charles Seed and all the rest, we have a panel of about 11 to 12 lecturers. So we have the full strength of lecturers and I can now uh, cut down to only four hours I'm teaching. At one time I was teaching 13 hours. <laughs> so I'm playing center forward, half back, goalkeeper, everything. <laughs> when you first started the college, how did you go about preparing the curriculum, etc.? To be frank, we just prepare this uh, along a general principle and year by year to try to provide whatever subjects we can teach. So it is just like uh, living from hand to mouth. And many times I'm just only one lesson ahead of my students because there are so many things to do. However, we had helpers come in and Later on, Philip Hain graduated. He helped, helped me. I had a good friend, a Hebrew teacher, in Mrs. Ben Asher. She was a pure Jew, Jewess, to teach us a modern Hebrew. Then I had uh, even G.D. James help me to teach evangelism. We had Dr. Inches, a medical missionary of the OMF, but he taught church history which was his favorite subject. Like that, you see, we, 
We just have to play by ear and live from hand to mouth. Mm-hmm. How was uh, lectures being conducted in the past, in the early years? We took over one of the dorm, dorm rooms. Dr. To, how did you build up your pool of lecturers? First of all, I had my brother-in-law, Reverend Dr. Peter Ng, who got his uh, 